Welcome to the Institute for Government. Uh, I'm Julian McRae. I'm Deputy Director here at the Institute. Um, and today we have uh, one of those wonderful occasions when we can sort of sit back and listen to the, the thinking about the future of the civil service, or the way we're going to think about the future of the civil service, I think, with, with Bernard Jenkin here, who is really, really pleased to have you here to talk about the inquiry that PACAC is undertaking on the work of the civil service. I think it's safe to say that one of the things that we observe from the Institute is the churn in people and personalities who are involved in thinking about how we run the administration in the UK, how it operates. Uh, Bernard is one of the key constants now in that since uh, 2010, being chair of the relevant uh, committee in Parliament. And I think it's safe to say that as I've listened, read, watched what PACAC and its predecessor committee have been doing and the output you've been producing, more and more nuanced, subtle, informative uh, views on the future of the civil service um, and indeed you know, how we can take on some of those huge historic challenges, putting them in the correct context, but also thinking about how they operate for today. Um, and I'm deeply looking forward to the work uh, of this inquiry. Uh, and what will actually be coming out the other side of it. Um, but Bernard approached us and asked us if we would host him to talk about that work before it, uh, it goes into its major phases uh, to help refine, I think, some of the aspects that it's looking at and to feed into that thinking. So I'm really pleased to see so many people here today. Uh, and to open up this debate, Bernard will work through some of the uh, thoughts, talk to us for about 20 minutes or so on that. I'll ask a few questions that come out of that, but then most of the session hopefully will be turned over to people in the audience. There's a huge wealth of experience here uh, to question, probe, comment, provide your own stories and tales into that discussion, which can then hopefully, I, I trust, help the work in the committee as it goes forward. Um, Usual um, sort of housekeeping rules apply. Uh, this is an on the record sort of session. Uh, please feel free to tweet. We have hashtag IFG Jenkin uh, as the hashtag for this. Um, and uh, please do, uh, when we get to that stage, please uh, have your thoughts and comments ready. Excellent. Without any further ado, Baron, to hand over to you and uh, take us through your thoughts. Well, thank you very much indeed uh, for this opportunity. I'm, I'm very flattered. <laughs> Uh, that you've taken up my uh, suggestion and um, I'm very en encouraged and um, humbled that so many people have come to listen uh, to um, the same old crack record going round and round. Uh, you must have read so many of our reports. Um, but um, uh, I, I'm, I hope that we're having an effect on the way people think about the civil service and talk about civil service reform. And um, to, hash, to have the new hashtag IFG Jenkin, that's a new medal I shall wear with great pride um, um, for this occasion. Um, and I should add that um, um, a speech for select committee chairman is the personal utterances of the chairman of the committee, but I, um, I've shared the text of this speech with my fellow <coughs> committee members and um, uh, they have influenced it. In a speech at Howard and Castle in 1999, uh, today's civil service was described in the mellifluous prose, which so easily froze from Professor Lord Hennessy, as the greatest single governing gift of the 19th to the 20th century, and by implication to the 21st century. It is an organization that still carries the mystique of a great historic institution, which is also part of the fabric of our largely unwritten constitution, it has been revered as a paradigm of impartiality, integrity and excellence, copied as the exemplar for good governments around the world, parodied affectionately in Yes Minister, painfully in the thick of it, and is praised by ministers as the finest in the world. In the face of so many challenges and changes over the decades, it has shown remarkable adapt adapt adaptability and resilience. Again, I recall Peter Hennessy informally describing there were three key people who helped to transform the civil service during the 20th century. Not Haldane, Fulton and Sir Derek Rayner, but somewhat surprisingly, the Kaiser, Hitler and Mrs Thatcher. <laughs> I think the point he was making that significant change in the civil service occurred as much as a result of events as from conscious efforts to reform 
and perhaps leaving the EU will prove one such transformative challenge. In fact, conscious efforts to reform the civil service have usually failed. Ironically, this is testament to the strength and resilience of the institution. The Fulton Report became the archetype of a Royal Commission that took minutes to announce and then years to conclude its work, with far less effect than intended. And many of its conclusions and recommendations bear reading today, but have been ignored. For example, its conclusion that the civil service was based on the culture of the generalist, with a lack of skilled management, is a more too familiar criticism of the civil service today. And in the finest traditions of Whitehall, history has been repeated and more than once. After Tony Blair complained about the scars on his back arising from his attempt to reform public services, his government embarked on a programme of civil service reform called Modernising Government. But one then cabinet minister subsequently told me that she had been completely unaware there was anything called a civil service reform programme during her period of office until long after she had left. The 2010 government contained more than a handful of ministers who had served in the government before 1997. They say something happened to the civil service in the, in the intervening years, complaining that it felt less responsive, more resistant, more bureaucratic, more hierarchical, and risk averse. At first, Francis Mort thought there was no need for a civil service reform plan, and then he introduced the civil service reform plan in 2012. In one respect, just in time. The West Coast Main Line debacle blew up in October 2012. The problems with the introduction of universal credit were coming to light, as were problems with major contracts and major projects. There were stunning successes too, such as the Olympic De Delivery Authority, though the Army had to step in to rescue operations contracted out to G4S. In 2012, uh, a report published by the NEO predicted that 42% of major projects would be on time and on budget. This included Crossrail, which completed 7,000 metres of tunnelling on time and 1 billion under budget. And over this period, Whitehall was delivering substantial cuts in public spending across most departments with step changes in efficiency alongside some ambitious policies such as schools reform. So a moment of tribute to Francis Maud. He made great progress in areas such as IT and digitisation of public services and achieved some very substantial savings by centralising procurement and rationalising the Whitehall estate. However, our 2013 inquiry report, Truth to Power, How Civil Service Reform Can Succeed, identified three principal shortcomings in the conventional approach to Whitehall reform. First, though many of the proposed changes were laudable, they did not amount to a comprehensive corporate change programme because the approach was managerial rather than strategic. Secondly, proposals intended to increase ministers' control over permanent secretary appointments and their private offices, gave rise to the fear that the civil service is being subject to what Peter Hennessy called creeping politicisation, and seemed to go against the grain of the Northcote Trevelyan principles, setting many against the plan. Thirdly, the approach failed to address people and leadership, and there was no coherent or comprehensive analysis of what the underlying problems arising from the culture of the civil service might be. These gave rise to the shortcomings identified in the reform plans, including skills gaps, risk aversion, and poor inter interdepartmental working. In 2013, the one year on plan also failed to address these issues and only touched on the issue of civil service culture. The latest plans for reform still largely retreat to the safety of emphasising outcomes rather than analysing processes and conversations that determine outcomes. PASC predicted these reforms as a whole would fail. The attempt to make change can, like a stone falling into a pond, make a great splash, but then leaves rather less lasting effect. In our Truth to Power report, PASC made only one recommendation, that a parliamentary commission should be established to take a long-term look at the civil service, to examine its nature, role and purpose, and to develop a strategic vision for its future. The committee recommended this inquiry should include consideration of the relationship between ministers and their officials. <coughs> and it's interesting that Fulton, the last detailed examination of the overall structure, function and future of the civil service, was explicitly barred from considering this topic leaving it unable to tackle the question of accountability.
The PASC recommendation was widely supported and was subsequently endorsed by the Liaison Committee in its report, Civil Service Lacking Capacity, which stated that this commission should be established, and I quote, as a matter of urgency, unquote. However, the recommendation was strenuously resisted by the government. I now accept that Fulton was a demonstration of how attempts to reform the civil service from outside are actually likely to fail. Inside the civil service, so much depends upon relationships. And yet, the more frustrated ministers became with their departments, the more they demanded powers of appointment or more direct control, the more taboo the subject of the actual relationships seemed to become. And this underlines that the civil service has to be seen in the context of the whole of government, including how permanent officials interact with ministers and their advisers. This is the problem of dual leadership, further complicated by how Whitehall is scrutinised by Parliament. And the context is changing, with increased scrutiny of government, higher expectations of the public, accelerating technological change, and the changing international context. Since 1968, we have emerged from what some called the age of deference into the age of reference, from a society which accepted what institutions chose to present to the outside world to one in which people feel entitled to know what is going on inside. The internet, 24-7 media, FOI, and perhaps overly aggressive select committee scrutiny have turned ministers' private offices sometimes into a goldfish bowl. At the same time, what people feel entitled to expect from government has escalated massively. Government, like business, must implement changing technology, where change appears to be accelerating exponentially. And in the international sphere, government must not only respond to the demands of its own population, but also to the effects of globalization, rising population around the world, and mass migration, the rise of new powers, of vast international corporations, and dealing with scarce natural resources, environmental degradation, and increasingly diverse and unpredictable security threats. So we have inherited Victorian or Edwardian institutions that must adapt to confront the massively massive complexity that is the new normal. This requires a different kind of mental agility and adaptability and a capacity for strategic thinking that some even suggest requires Whitehall to consider itself to be psychologically and organisationally on a kind of war footing in order to be able to engage quickly enough with complexity in the nation and in its global context. And for change to be successful and self-sustaining, an organisation cannot be dependent upon hero leaders or dominant personalities. They can seem so alluring, but they never deliver successful self-sustaining change. Real change depends upon collaboration at scale, within and between teams, rather than on individuals. Achieving the commitment of the whole team towards change is most successful when the aims of this change are clearly aligned with the mission and values of the organisation. And it is no coincidence that the most successful businesses are those like John Lewis, or my old employer Ford Motor Company, whose values and commitment to their customers, stakeholders and society as a whole are powerful. It is fortunate that the civil service is fundamentally underpinned naturally by the same kind of alignment of mission and values with operational aims. However, as I will outline below, there are concerns that changes to the operating model of Whitehall have resulted in a lack of clarity regarding what the role of the civil service is and should be. The operating model of Whitehall has changed radically. And this is a, I, I wouldn't describe it as an organisation chart so much as a cartoon. Um, um, but instead of a Prime Minister as primus inter pares, chairing a cabinet treated with deference and respect, at least until the present one, I mean, I'm, I'm, the, the office of Prime Minister, I'm going to get this right, the office of Prime Minister has become increasingly presidential and the role of the cabinet and key officials has tended to be sidelined. I'll go back, that's it. Oh, sorry. There we are. Um, this is the sort of second cartoon, and I'm not saying that the present Prime Minister is operating in this, in this fashion, but it's, it's become the fashion of modern Prime Ministers. 
The autonomy of Whitehall departments envisaged by Haldane has become increasingly subject to direction from number 10 and political appointees in the Cabinet Office who rain down new policies and initiatives on government departments without the context of operational experience. In departments, the role of the Permanent Secretary as the principal policy advisor has been eclipsed. And at the same time, Whitehall has seen the growth of outsourcing on a massive scale through arm's length bodies and of government companies and contracts. This has changed the very nature of what civil servants do and have put many functions beyond direct accountability to ministers or department, departmental officials. And just go back a slide for a second. There's another change that occurred. The career path used to be in departments and it used to be to nurture ex departmental expertise so that the permanent secretary would more often than not come from within that department. Go to the next slide again. Now we have a generalist career path where the fast streamers don't even join a department. They are sent around the departments to try and give them as broad an experience as possible. <coughs> and the churn, of, um, uh, the churn in posts has gone up as well. And that militates against that expertise. But looking at this second slide, look how <coughs> long the, the learning feedback loop has become. The ability of the system to learn from experience is far more challenging when those who are driving a new policy are in the Cabinet Office or the Number 10 Policy Unit, and the people implementing the policy are not even directly employed by the responsible department. And today's politicians also tend to overload the system with new initiatives with, without regard to the limitations of capacity. And uh, it, we are now in a situation where we've just overlaid the whole challenge of Brexit onto everything else the government was trying to deliver before Brexit. Despite all this, there's been no comprehensive reconsideration of the purpose, structure, function and future of the civil service, and efforts to reform the civil service have only been modest or piecemeal. And this has resulted in a lack of clarity regarding the role of the civil service, and even the civil service's collective sense of what it is and what kind of identity it now has. And this confusion has not been helped by the abolition of the National School for Government. Whatever, whatever its shortcomings may have been, there is now a gap where there should be a safe haven for thinkers and teachers to consider these questions. This underlines what an important role the Institute for Government now plays, but can the civil service contract out this function? If the root causes of the problems facing the civil service are to be addressed, it is important that there is a detailed and systematic analysis of the purpose and role of the civil service and of what structures and capabilities are needed to enable it to carry out its role effectively. But to prevent this becoming a rerun of Fulton, it must talk about what people in the civil service find the most difficult to talk about, how individuals tend to behave, and the attitudes they adopt and when we use the word culture, this is what the word should really mean. In any particular workplace, yes, this gets uncomfortably personal. But we need to understand, what is it that wears down the idealism and enthusiasm of a young civil service recruit over the years? What does the system inadvertently value? And what does it tend to undervalue? What is it that makes officials wary of being too open and too risk of, makes them too risk averse. Whenever I quote one piece of evidence to our report, Truth to Power, to a group of civil servants, or indeed to almost any other group, I always get knowing and slightly pained smiles. <coughs> one of our advisors, Professor Andrew Kakabadzi, Professor of Governance and Leadership at the Handy Business School, who is now a PACAC advisor, explained that there are four salient features of a failing organization. And let me say, I don't think the Civil service is a failing organisation. First, most people in a failing organisation know it is failing, but they do not know how to talk about it with their work colleagues. Secondly, many people attend meetings and agree to things in that meeting, but then leave the meeting and express something different. Thirdly, it tends to be good people who leave a failing organisation and the less good who remain and stay quiet. And finally, in failing organisations, the leadership are the last to admit the seriousness of the challenges they face. And this is by no means characteristic of the civil service as a whole, but in pockets where things have gone wrong, it is common enough. The solution is to have leadership who give permission to speak 
and this depends upon ministers being welcoming of the truth as well as senior officials who are likely to take their lead from ministers. Apparently, every time the Olympic Delivery Authority met, it was confronted by the prospect of massive cost overruns, personnel disasters, retarded delivery contracts, and a sense of looming disaster. Every meeting ended with Paul Dighton congratulating all those present on a fantastic meeting. Since Truth to Power was published, even though the principal recommendation was rejected, we feel our sustained analysis and commentary in this and other reports has succeeded in promoting better conversations around Whitehall. People now talk more openly about the importance of learning from failure as well as from success. The institutional reflex after the West Coast mainline contribute was simply to move on in the jargon of disaster management. But a sustained effort by one senior official ensured that there was learning and change as a consequence. The former lead departmental non-executive director and former head of BP, when he was speaking from this platform, told the IFG that failure is the meat and drink of a successful business. There is evidence that parts of Whitehall have changed to take on this lesson, but there is still a way to go. And the civil service also continues to lack an institutional structure and culture that enables leadership to best promote and sustain that change. So PACAC is undertaking uh, this new inquiry into the civil service to continue to promote conversation inside Whitehall, concentrating not just on the structure and organisation of the civil service, but how appropriate it is for the 21st century, and also on its governance and the attitudes and behaviours that determine the effectiveness of the civil service, how well it does learn from success and failure. This depends upon its collective capabilities as well as civil servants' individual skills, particularly their leadership skills and how leaders talk about and live the mission and values and identity of the civil service. How do we measure its success? Given that the most successful organisations lay great emphasis on successful employee engagement. It is surprising that permanent secretary job descriptions hardly mention measures of engagement as a criteria for success. And yet clearly it's a driver of performance. Of all the targets that could be set, uh, this is one measure that could not be gained. And I welcome the present review of performance management of individuals. Uh, the so-called guided distribution, which requires assessors to rank a set proportion of the staff as performing worse than relative to others, is inherently adversarial. Some organisations manage performance by instruction and tasking, then measurement and assessment, followed by reward or punishment. Others encourage better performance by agreeing shared objectives with individuals, supporting and mentoring them through their tasks, and then reviewing and learning with them for the future. Ask yourself, which organisation would you prefer to work for, organisation A or organisation B? So we will be looking at a summary of the results of confidential research, not the raw data, which will remain confidential, to be conducted into the prevailing attitudes and behaviours in the civil service, which promotes effectiveness and which undermine it. What effect has the 2012 civil service reform plan had? Did its aims go far enough? How resistant is the civil service to change and why? Do civil servants learn the right lessons from success and failure? Why do some departments or public bodies handle change better than others? On the question of sustainability, we will be asking how sustainable it is for the civil service to depend increasingly upon skills imported from outside the civil service by employing contractors and consultants and by recruiting directly from other sectors. Our skills inquiry highlighted the inherent weaknesses and costs of this dependency. Successful contracting out is not just about signing a company up to the deal that looks like the best deal. Success also depends upon civil servants managing that contract through its life and their understanding of exactly what the contractor must do to deliver what the public increasingly demands. So you still need the core skills in-house. Nor can government rely on direct recruitment of skills from outside. Non-civil servants are not necessarily imbued with the spirit of public service that civil servants demonstrate, and they tend to find the experience of government is alien to them. Therefore, unless they can adapt, they feel rejected, and once they leave, the experience they gained 
is lost, the antithesis of best value. For these reasons, the best functioning organisations do not recruit much from outside, but develop talent from within. Consideration therefore needs to be given to how the civil service can develop more of its own people's skills, capability and talent. PASC's skills inquiry highlighted four types of learning for developing leaders. Experiential learning, which is learning on the job and is what civil servants are most used to. Reflective learning, which means engaging in roles and then reflecting on what did and did not work, usually with some sort of mentor. This is one of the most expensive forms of learning. Uh, it is one of the most effective forms of learning. It is a type of learning that is hardly carried out at all in the civil service. Conceptual learning, which is more the traditional classroom-based learning, and experimental learning. I always imagine the idea that um, a civil servant will say, I just want to experiment with this, is going to um, send ministers into a fear, a paroxysms of fear. The latter type involves people engaging in active experimentation in their jobs and then discussing the results with a group of peers. All these ideas go far beyond what is produced by civil service learning and underline the lacuna left by the abolition of the National School for Government. Will the Civil Service Leadership Academy fill this gap? I just asked the question. This bears on the most fundamental questions. What should the Civil Service be for? What should its primary functions be? Does the Civil Service have a coherent identity? How clear is its idea of itself? And what ministers expect of it? Who provides the necessary institutional leadership for the civil service to deliver government policy whilst remaining impartial? Who has the time to do that job? How can the senior civil service be made into a more effective leadership group? And perhaps most important of all, who is responsible for the governance of the civil service? Who defines the mission for the civil service? Who is the guardian of its aims and values? And who is responsible for ensuring that civil servants adopt the most effective attitudes and behaviours that will fulfil that mission according to those values? To what extent should a new national school for government fulfil this role? Yes, I support the Leadership Academy, but it should, it should be just one part of a new national school for government, and this cannot be outsourced to Harvard or MIT. So why has it taken so long to get to this point? Well, I've been learning that reform is not something that you can do to an organisation from outside. The will to do this has to come from within. And this is going to be really hard, because it is so personal, about what attitudes and behaviours prevail in the civil service, about what how attitudes that individuals have and individuals demonstrate in their behaviour some of which needs to be nurtured and supported, some of which needs to be confronted in those individuals. But I'm confident that th there is an appetite for real change. The changes our nation faces are increasing in number, in complexity and in pace. But we can have a civil service that better draws upon both the best of its traditions and on the strengths of today's people and society. And to that respect, I should emphasise the importance of diversity. It is a civil service that depends less on command and control, more on cooperation and collaboration. Change is happening, but it must happen faster. And this depends upon better understandings, both explicit and implicit. And it's worth just asking how many of the implicit understandings that used to underpin the civil service in days gone by have simply been discarded or eroded. And this depends on better understandings in people's working relationships and upon coherent leadership and governance from the top. Because unless the leadership makes it the priority throughout the organisation that people should talk about and live the right attitudes and behaviour within the organisation, change will happen very slowly, if at all. And the leadership must be united, making this goal their priority so that they can enlist and enthuse even the resistors, or the resistors will exploit the division and paralyse progress. Organisations, whether commercial or not, 
that put other goals ahead of their mission and values or ahead of the interests of their employees and stakeholders are on a slippery slope. The most valuable quality, therefore, in any organisation is trust. Senior officials and ministers can have no confidence in what they are being told unless there is trust. Officials cannot speak truth to power unless they can trust that their openness and sincerity will be valued and that mistakes, and particularly their own honest mistakes, will lead to learning rather than punishment. Ministers and permanent secretaries must be able to trust in those upon whom they depend in order to run their departments. The civil service is an institution whose mission and values are embedded in its very existence. Just imagine if the energy dissipated by needless politicking, silo working, hoarding of information, pointless competition, and uh, every time we witness the annual spending round, I'm thinking of how destructive and adversarial a tradition that has become. The, uh, and resistance to change, just imagine if all this energy could be harnessed to support the mission of the civil service to achieve what the government as a whole wants to achieve for the nation. It does a fantastic job under very difficult circumstances. But to get this kind of change, ultimately it's about the people. In a real crisis, its people have always risen to the challenge in the past. Today's world of permanent crisis is just the challenge our civil service should relish, and I'm sure it does. Thank you very much indeed. So thank you. Thank you, Bird. Um, I think for people who've got used to sometimes people talking about civil service reform almost by the uh, wiring diagram route into it, I think that was a refreshing sort of tour of let's think about the people and the organisation, the relationships that drive any kind of organisation, how these, how these interact. And something that comes out again and again in our work when we talk sometimes about the structures, but quite often um, it's the relationships that underlie a lot of that. Um, so if, I, if I can just, first question that was playing in my mind as you were talking, I mean obviously in Whitehall the absolutely key relationship, the defining feature of Whitehall Department is that interface between the political and the administrative. Um, how far is your inquiry going to look at, if you like, the ministerial side of that in conjunction with the civil service side and how you make those relationships really work coming from both um, sort of sides of the spectrum? Well, I think, it's, it's, I mean, you can't consider for a moment the civil service without thinking of its political context as I adverted to in the speech. And um, there needs to be ways of generating a more consistent and constructive expectation of what ministers will, what service they're going to be offered when they arrive in their departments, what, what expected of their role. Uh, when we were taking evidence on what do ministers do, mm. um, uh, the spectrum of opinion from ministers stretched from uh, Jeff Rooker, uh, who uh, said s some ministers are under a misapprehension that they're there to run their departments, they're not. Uh, they're there to oversee their departments and set the policy. Um, to the other extreme, where one Secretary of State told me, I said, how often do you meet your permanent secretary? And he shall remain nameless. Uh, and he said, hardly at all. He, she just does the pay and rations. I run the department. Um, and, you know, there needs to be... Um, I don't think the civil service can be expected to accommodate, well, it has to, every kind of minister that arrives on their doorstep. But the, the, there should be a, a clearer expectation instilled into the political class about what the relationship between them and their officials should be. Um, and we looked at this as well in um, uh, special advisors in the thick of it. Um, after one particular SPAD disaster. <coughs> um, and I think that special advisors have got a lot to answer for in terms of uh, their importance. Some ministers make their special advisors extremely important. Mm. One special advisor told me that he ran the department. Um, the um, others recognize that they shouldn't be interfering in the relationship between ministers and their officials. They're there, there to advise the minister. But I mean, there needs to be more definition to these roles, um, I think, in order to provide stability in that relationship. But then we also need to talk about it, because if we don't talk about it, if it becomes the taboo subject, uh, because it's all too difficult to talk about, um, so most ministers will tell you that their officials were absolutely fantastic. 
because they have to think that. <laughs> Otherwise, it goes. But I mean, I think most 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 officials do build a very positive relationship with their ministers. Um, I think a lot of the frustration, in fact, comes from junior ministers who who are surprised to find that the civil service looks to the Secretary of State and not even much to a Minister of State unless yeah. the Secretary of State has made it very explicit that the, Secretary, the Minister of State has that, that authority. So I think there's a lot of complexity in there, um, which, you know, perhaps at the outset, instead of rushing straight to their desks and starting to do stuff, to use the vernacular, um, used by a former Minister for the Civil Service, they should actually talk about how they're going to work together before they start working. Excellent. Thank you. And just picking up on one of the things, you came back to it a few times in the speech, the National School of Government, um, and the fact that you felt that that, that was a real lack inside our system. I wonder, one of the things that, just observing some of the research we've done on the learning and development institutions that have been used by the civil service itself, they tend to have quite a cycle of invention and destruction. Um, and, you know, leadership academy is, I think, a welcome, I'm not quite sure exactly what it's going to involve, but I think a welcome move to create something there. But I sense that there's something larger necessary. Um, if I look at sort of things like ANZOG um, in you know, Australia, New Zealand, or the Hertie School of Government in Germany, tend to find those institutions actually anchored not necessarily in the administration, but actually have an anchor outside, which makes them slightly more persistent. Um, is that something you'll look at, or do you think this is the national school is the model that you want to... Uh, well, I, I, I say a, a national school for government. I don't think we should turn the clock back. Uh, I think we should recognise what didn't satisfy um, in terms of the old National School for Government. It's ironic that the, the Sunningdale uh, is now occupied by the Police Leadership Academy. Uh, it's been taken over by another um, very important training body. The, the Leadership Academy, Civil Service Leadership Academy, is going to be based in Shrivenham. Maybe that would be a good place to anchor a new um, university of government or something. But um, um, uh, I think um, to have something independent mm -hmm. outside the immediate, I mean command chain is not the right word for the civil service, but outside, outside the framework of normal decision making, but an organisation of the scale and size of the civil service um, certainly merits having its in-house capacity to train its own people. Um, and having worked in other large organisations myself, it is very odd that somebody decided that this shouldn't happen. And uh, as soon as it happened, one of our advisors told us, don't worry, it'll, it'll come back. And in fact, um, uh, when that advisor now tells us that it's coming back much faster than even they anticipated, because it's obviously leaving a gap. Excellent. And thank you. Um, and last just question from me. I just, you, you talked about the inquiry is looking to promote conversation within Whitehall. Um, I don't think many people, when they talk about parliamentary inquiries, necessarily instantly think that these are helpful for promoting internal conversation. They have various roles and various tones that they set. Um, what do you think is going to be different about how you conduct this inquiry? How is it going to promote that sort of conversation? Is that something you're going to try and actively build into how the inquiry runs and works? Or is it that a report will provide us speaking sort of a talking point for people uh, when it comes out? Is there, is there well, I think it's both. Um, uh, and I think the tone in which we conduct our inquiry, um, in a genuine sense of inquiry, rather than the rather more aggressive scrutiny that we've seen in some committees, that's important. The fact that um, uh, we're going to draw on research, I mean, you may remember Catherine Baxendale's paper mm. uh, are based on interviews that was published just before the 2015 election. Um, we need more of that kind of um, interlocutory, very personal research. And I emphasize where that research is conducted, I don't want to see the conversations. I don't want my committee to be able to read those conversations and then interrogate ministers or officials about what so-and-so said. Absolutely not. But to have advisors who have worked on that kind of material and drawn conclusions on it, mm. advising the committee about what conclusions there should be and giving prominence to those conclusions in our reports, I think that is a positive way of promoting the right kind of conversation. And I'm always struck, actually, <laughs> um, during the last Parliament, PASC was the most online watched select committee. 
<laughs> now, I think that's partly because when the, somebody like the Cabinet Secretary comes in front of our committee, an awful, awful lot of departmental TV screens uh, or computers are switched on uh, to watch what he is saying. So the way we conduct our inquiry actually does, you know, very often, well, one of the things I've learned as a Select Committee Chairman, actually very often the evidence session does the job, the publication of the report <laughs> is just uh, a kind of icing on the cake. Um, and the, it's the act of scrutiny that um, uh, changes the chemistry of the conversations that are going on. And one, uh, when we started out down this track uh, in, uh, at the beginning of the 2010 Parliament, um, our first inquiry was about strategic thinking. Um, we, you know, we, were, we were talking about a lot of stuff that wasn't even in the language of, um, of the senior civil service. And I, and I think just by talking about stuff, it gets it into the language, and people talk about it and think about it in different ways. I hope it's. I hope it's called. I hope. I hope it's. I hope we have influence. And I think it's not about ramming recommendations down the throats of unwilling officials and ministers. Yes. Excellent. Well, I can assure you that the TV screens do indeed come on in this building when the uh, PACAC is working, and not just for the cabinet secretary. Um, can I take some questions and we'll uh, sort of kick off? I, I think the lady there, I'll take them in batches of three and then in front and then there and I'll come back to work. Hi there, my name is Seppi Golzari Munro. Um, thank you very much indeed for your very thoughtful presentation. Um, I wanted to ask about the extent to which you've explored the sources of ministerial frustration. Um, I guess my concern and what was going through, through my head and, and what I've heard anecdotally is that quite often sources of ministerial uh, frustration do tend to be as a result of um, not necessarily civil service inertia, but actually the rule of law. <laughs> and so when they're told that they, they can't do certain things because they are, you know, it's the rule of law as opposed to the rule of, of, of the minister. Um, and that, that would be really interesting to explore. And I guess in that context to some slightly amend the phrase that you ended with last in the sense that the civil service's mission is to help the government achieve what it wants to achieve, comma, within the bounds of the law. Thank you. Um, just in front. Thank you very much. Richard Harris. I'm the director of the Power to Change Research Institute. Um, an observation, if I can, and a question. The observation was on the use of the word the civil service as a collective noun, which seemed to slip in and out of Whitehall and the civil service. And of course, as Lord Kurzlet used to point out, the vast majority of the civil service don't work anywhere near SW1. So uh, which are we talking about uh, in this conversation? Uh, and the question is, is, is this, thinking about your wiring diagram, Bernard, uh, would, the, would a potential solution for uh, the structure of the civil service be to have a genuine chief executive uh, running it with perhaps permanent secretaries redesignated as managing directors? Okay, thank you. And then gentlemen just here. Uh, I'm Peter Tomlinson, I'm not a civil servant, but my late father was a reluctant one, dragged in during World War II, and he never left it. I, I, will, I will write about my experience of that, but I want to make just one comment, which is that in railway parlance, a spad is a signal passed at danger. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very good. Uh, Bernard, do you want to uh, yes, I, pick I, up on those frustrations I, of ministers and, uh, you know, see... I, I, just in passing, I will say I was Shadow Secretary of State for Transport during that period <laughs> of spads, and um, I, the irony has struck me as well. And maybe it's, um, it's an irony that should inform us about the danger of spads. Um, the, this question about the rule of law, um, uh, of course the rule of law is not a, um, the interpretation of the law is very often not an absolute, um, and, is, and I think ministers quite often feel that they're subjected to very cautious interpretations of the law. And uh, um, some ministers have found themselves going outside the department to get an alternative legal opinion and have used that as the basis of their advice. And also, um, uh, ministers are meant to take legal advice. They don't actually have to act on legal advice. Obviously, they, need to, they should not be knowingly acting illegally because they would be pers personally liable if they disregard very clear um, advice. But if the advice is half of one and half a dozen, it's, it's up to the minister to decide how much risk they're going to take. 
And um, I think, again, that it's about educating the conversation. Um, but, um, you know, some things have, have been paralyzed by, I think, unnecessarily cautious legal advice. Um, so I think it fits exactly into that discussion about um, uh, the relationship between ministers and officials. And sometimes, you know, maybe legal advisors in government departments should be saying, look, um, this may be a technical breach, but nobody is actually going to take action over this, um, uh, or it's inconceivable that anybody's going to, you know, the way normal people behave in their normal lives. I mean, most companies would behave in that way. Um, it's not about doing something bad, by the way. I'm not. I'm not constituting. I mean, what you know? What, what is the motive for doing something? Is it a proper, respectable motive? Um, if, if, if it's in a grey area of the law, that, that matters probably more than the fact that it's in a grey area of the law. Um, when we're talking about the civil service, Richard, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, of course, the civil service that um, Northcote Trevelyan created was a very small civil service, um, and now everybody is a civil servant. But I mean, I think the unity of the, the greater civil service um, uh, I was at an event last night where somebody read out a 1947 Treasury issued handbook, handbook for the new civil servant, um, and somebody starting work as a civil servant in uh, Gordon Manzies actually, um, uh, in uh, uh, Edinburgh in 1947, and it was all there, the doctrine of ministerial accountability and you're working for the minister, you know, right from the start. So. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I think the idea that there's a sort of servant class below the civil service would be rather old fashioned to go back to. But yes, we're talking about the top of the civil service. And whether we should go to CEOs and MDs? You know, if you start changing job titles, are you really changing people's attitudes and behaviours, which is what we're talking about? Well, we have a chief executive government, but he doesn't actually have a chief executive power. Yes, um, noted. Um, <laughs> you, you may uh, have answered your own question me, there. Anyway. It reminds me of a, a, a Jack Straw anecdote he, he gave us in evidence when he found that an, a vital official was missing from a meeting and said, where is he? Oh, he's been moved to another job, Secretary of State. Well, I want him in this meeting. Oh, he's not in this department. He's gone to another department. And he doesn't do this job anymore. So he went to see the head of the civil service and said, look, I want this person back in this job. Uh, and the head of the civil service said, well, I don't... I'm, I'm head of the civil service, but I don't actually run it. <laughs> um, um, and there is a question of, we have to decide something. And uh, uh, is government so multifarious and so many different things that we have to have separate government departments? Um, and if you look how different the departments are from each other, then you're going to have to have departments. Um, I mean, I can't... Uh, the idea of creating the it was a, a um, the cabinet office number ten into a more more like a corporate headquarters that drives everything from the centre. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced. I think Haldane was right on departments, but I mean I, I I'm, I'm not really interested in job titles. When people create job titles and they don't mean what they say, then I get worried. So, chief executive of the civil service, I think um, um, he is doing an extremely good job. Um, bringing a, a, a different perspective. I mean, if we could get the Treasury more interested in uh, real financial <coughs> management rather than just setting spending totals, for example, uh, more, more proper financial planning um, rather than just trying to meet particular targets uh, across departments, that would be, but I mean, I think it's the way departments interact with each other. And incidentally, that squiggly line of this horizontal career path. I don't think there's any evidence that it's helping cross-departmental working. I think cross-departmental working is about um, uh, how well people understand their departments so they're inter when they're interacting with other departments they know how to get things done. And just because you've worked across departments, I don't think that necessarily helps that. Okay. You know, another round of questions. Start with David there and then I've, I've got people clocked but I want to just come back around the front. Uh, uh, David Walker, Guardian Public. Um, I'm going to ask a question which I know none of the distinguished former permanent secretaries in the room would dare to ask because it offends the code of neutrality which is this. Are you a Tory? 
Um, and I ask the question because I believe members of your party have in recent years done various things like reduce uh, public expenditure by a large amount, uh, cut civil service pay and pensions, cap the amount that permanent secretaries can be paid, obviously affecting recruitment, and moreover, mounted a sustained, dare I say, ideological critique of large aspects of public management and indeed the being of the state. Now, you, Bernard, may not have shared that, but you have to acknowledge in your analysis that a political onslaught on the being of public management has been mounted in recent years, and that is part of the reason why your critique is apt. If you hold on a second, Bernard, we'll just take a couple more questions before you defend your Toryness. Um, to go to Andrew. Um, Bernard, I think you can make the case. Andrew, could you just introduce yourself? Oh, Andrew Turnbull, um, uh, a former cabinet secretary, but uh, that was ten years ago. Uh, you can make the case, and you should make the case, for reform modernization, whatever word you want, but you really do not need this tired old narrative about Edwardian Victorian institutions not changing. In my 35 years, 1970 to 2005, civil service changed enormously. And even in the 10 years since I left, it has changed enormously. So you don't need to, you should be talking about what it needs to do to adapt and get better. And so just junk all that stuff. The other thing is I think we should in a way doomed you to failure is that very interesting chart, one of the, the presidential style, although David Cameron does not think we have a presidential system because he, he would be still here if he was. Um, you've got to bring in all parts of this, not just the civil service. The civil service is one part of it. You've got to bring in the ministerial tier, the SPAD tier, even the, the all those interactions below the arm's length bodies and the, the wider public sector, because the civil service is what, f under four, um, 400,000 now, the whole public sector, five million, something like that, and then all the people working for it, thousands more. So if you don't bring in that key relationship, uh, particularly above it, I don't think you can really get the answers that you're looking for. Okay, Andrew, thank you. Um, I'm just going to take Indra. In there. Thanks very much. Indra Morris, uh, Director General of Civil Service at the Cabinet Office. Um, I mean, firstly, I thank you to you and the committee. I think the, um, myself and my colleagues certainly value the reflective challenge, the tone, and what you say about, if you like, creating the conditions for conversations about the taboo. Um, this is perhaps a risky thing to say, but actually I was really struck by how much common ground there is and how much I agree with you. Um, the importance, for example, of self-sustaining self change rather than a series of documents and plans, the importance of behaviours, uh, the importance of reflecting on relationships with ministers, truth unto power, risk aversion and trust has all got rather blurred. <laughs> um, the importance of talking about how officials and ministers are going to work together, not just launching into doing, which is incredibly difficult to resist, and indeed the role of the permanent secretary, which I think is is a really interesting area to explore. Um, I agree with you on the fast stream, actually, and I, although I wonder if that's because I'm a product of the old-fashioned system. Uh, National School of Government, likewise, although I wasn't sure, you seem to talk about that as the sort of guardian of the values, and actually, for me, the leadership have to be the guardian of values, not some sort of academic training. Uh, uh, body. I suppose three questions. Um, one is, I went to a brilliant event last week uh, hosted by David Liddington and the clerks to both houses, which was about parliamentary capability and the relationship between officials and parliament. Um, and I wondered actually whether you thought that was an area that you might also get into, because it's not one we've touched on. In your speech, you were critical, I think if I heard you right, uh, of the focus on outcomes rather than what you called underlying processes. And I th you know, if you could say a bit more about that, that would be great. And you mentioned that actually radical change often comes, in your view, from external events. And you mentioned Brexit. And so my question is, do you think it should be a transformative event? Or do you think it just might be? Excellent, thank you. Bernard, back to you. Well, well, um, just to um, dispel any doubt, I am a Conservative. <laughs> um, and um, um, I mean, how, how Conservative have some of the things that have been done? Um, I mean, I don't think it was very Conservative, the um, 
the period of, of what one might call um, when, when public choice theory was a very fashionable idea and that anybody working in the public sector was necessarily self-interested and therefore had to be, you know, it was much better to get this into the private sector where somehow it would be purer and it would be more accountable in some um, market sense. I mean, I don't agree with that at all. I mean, I mean even though I may, may have been part of that rather fashionable wave in the 80s and early 90s, um, the idea that something contracted out is something inherently better than something done in-house. Well, actually, the um, um, market testing proved <coughs> to a very large extent that what could be done in-house was just as good, if not better, than what could be done in the, in the private sector. Um, and, but when I, you know, it, it comes down to this fundamental question of what is, what is inherently the civil service got to be able to do um, um, and we came up with a list in a discussion yesterday that included um, uh, f financial planning and financial management, um, uh, um, contracting and uh, um, um, subcontracting and outsourcing, though somebody very rightly said you shouldn't call it outsourcing, you should just call it sourcing, because otherwise you're predisposed to get it out, which might not be the right answer, um, and HR management. I mean, it is ironic that the HR director for Whitehall has been brought in from outside. And is this something that the civil service has forgotten how to do it for itself? Um, and um, one senior civil servant um, complained to me that he found it impossible to plan anybody's career in the present civil service. That's obviously got to change. I mean, it would never, uh, that, would, that would never, I mean, the large corporations I've worked in, it would never work like that, where you just apply for whatever job you want uh, and hope for the best. Um, every man or woman for himself. So I'm, I'm a conservative, and I'm, I believe in um, uh, the strength of the, um, the the strength of the state as an institution, the strength of the civil service as an institution. Um, in answer to Andrew, it's always very intimidating to be speaking in front of a former cabinet secretary because. Um, <laughs> Uh, of their immense knowledge and experience, and here am I, a backbencher, never, I've only ever been a PPS. Um, so um, my experience of government is rather limited. But I mean, just two things. Yes, the civil service has changed very dramatically. But what this word change has been an enormous amount of, um, of change in the civil service, but have we actually got the change that is the most fundamental? Um, uh, and the most important. And um, I would argue that adapting attitudes and behaviours is the most important change. Um, other, other changes are very necessary, but they are, in the end, the most important change, which has maybe not happened in the civil service. And indeed, uh, coming back to that public choice theory and new public management, maybe that was the wrong kind of change um, uh, in terms of the kind of organisation that idealistic people, which most civil servants are, actually really want to work in. Pu you know, public-spirited, devoted public servants. Was new public management the right kind of change? Let's have a discussion about that. And, um, and what, what happens above? I mean, I thought I did. I mean, I found myself adding into my speech at late stages. I must put this in the political context, because, of course, um, I think the sentence didn't go in the end, but the question that we should be asking is, um, uh, how does the civil service sustain itself when in the end it's not actually responsible for itself it's the, civil, it's the politicians who come in and screw it up basically um, uh, it's, it's one of the challenges of the civil service uh, uh, has to deal with that it's not actually its own master um, there was that ridiculous row about what was in the um, in the job description of permanent secretaries that Francis didn't like, where it said permanent secretaries should ha have, bear in mind the long-term interests of their department, and I protect that from the minister. Um, and this was regarded as a sort of constitutional crisis by that particular minister, if you remember. And then, again, it comes down to that um, understanding that, that we need to have about what, what's important about ministerial role. Again, in the discussion yesterday, maybe we should be reminding ministers, you are a secretary, a secretary of state. You are a minister of the crown. You're, put, you're, you're participating in something much more permanent than just your career and your government. Um, you, are, you are becoming part of the guardian of the system, uh, not just 
to exploit something. I'm very interested to hear all the stuff from the Director General of Civil Service Reform. Thank you for all that. Um, uh, on the National School for Government as a guardian of values, it's not that they take over the leadership. No, I think it's about there being um, a, a safe space for people to go and discuss this stuff, including the leadership, and to go and talk to people who are thinking about this offline. Um, it's support for the leadership. Uh, that's the way I envisage it. Um, um, yes, parliamentary accountability is not a subject we're going to neglect um, as part of this inquiry. And yes, it's one of the criticisms of the civil service, isn't it, that oh, well, they're, they're all obsessed by process and they're not concerned about outcomes. But I promise you, obsessing about outcomes without thinking about how the process affects the outcome, I mean, I'm, I'm saying let's analyse these processes and see if whether they're actually conducive to the right outcomes. Um, um, the different question as to whether civil servants are preoccupied by following process um, is a different question. Um, but I think there's a... You know, what kind of conversations are there before a submission arrives on a minister's desk? Um, uh, I hope, sorry, can I tell another anecdote? Um, well, as a former advisor from the Treasury told our committee that Gordon Brown had this terrible habit of insisting that the original author of a submission, uh, quite a junior official, should, should come and present the submission in his uh, office. Uh, when Gordon Brown left the Treasury, Permanent Secretary turns to another official and says, well, thank goodness we won't have to go on doing that anymore. Um, you know, is it the right process to, um, to, to have um, uh, uh, um, submissions filtered by senior officials, or should there be a much flatter, flatter structure? I guess the, stru the flatter structure is developing in the modern world. So, thanks. Uh, more random questions. Not uh, true. Lady uh, there, and then I'll go Cabinet the Secretary back. assures me that anecdote is not true. It's not true. Hmm? Well, it's been a while. Yes, Hello, Bernard Joe Clift, um, ex civil servant. Um, I was thinking about your point about implicit understandings in the civil service, or how I would I would sort of describe it as implicit mores, and how do you get cont continuity of those, and how do you know? when they've elapsed. So I remember working with private officers when I first joined government sort of 20 years ago. And the private officers themselves, this, this speaks to your point about job descriptions for ministers and, and SPADs, but the private officers were very clear that they had two roles. They were, they were serving the minister, but they were serving the department. And they knew that they had a responsibility to to know what was what and, and say no to the minister as appropriate and, and, and find a way of traversing that. And sometimes, in my experience, that's just not the case now with very young private officers. And, and how do we, um, so collectively, although I'm not a civil servant anymore, um, sort of account for that and find a way of keeping the really important parts of the organisation sort of clear and clean and established? It's, it's a rhetorical question. Well. Excellent, mm. thank you. And Mike. Adam Steinhaus, formerly of the National School of Government. I loved your learning styles, types of learning slide, Bernard, because of course it reminded me very much of the ethos of the National School, which was not at all some kind of academic training ground as I heard just now. My colleagues were passionate educators with real experience of the civil service, and we were brought down by inept leadership, lack of support in the cabinet office, and of course the nefarious actions of one minister, Mr. Maud. So my question is, you address some of this very well in the civil service skills report, the PASC report. I'm just wondering about the outcome of that report, because there were quite a few paragraphs about the National School. I'm just wondering what feedback you then had and whether any of that will feed into the current report. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Um, Mike. Dave Penman, uh, General Secretary of the FDA. Uh, Bernard, I'm very sorry to hear you're having trouble sleeping and you've taken to reading the Staff Handbook of the Treasury from 1947 to solve it. <laughs> um, I, I, I was quite struck by, by, by your speech. Uh, my heart sank a little bit when I saw the first 
diagram or cartoon, as you called it. I thought you were going to, uh, once again, uh, uh, suggest reorganisation as, as the solution. But what really struck me is you talked about the people and people issues, and that if the civil service is, is to be an agile uh, workforce, then addressing those people issues over the longer term is key. You talked a lot about behaviours and development, performance management, which has been a disaster and a distraction for the civil service uh, for over a decade, and that the solution really is about having a skilled and motivated workforce. I hope you also talk about paying rations in your report and the role that that has. But I've got two questions. First of all, how can you ensure that your report is more than just a conversation piece in the civil service? If it does address those issues, and those issues really are key to the success of the civil service, how can you ensure that actually some of that is taken forward? And secondly, you talked about events, and clearly the biggest event the civil service is going to have to face is Brexit. Paul Jenkin called it the single biggest legal administrative and legislative challenge in peacetime history. How can that be delivered without an, a single penny of extra resource? Very um, much. Right. Collection um, questions. Um, what I would reflect about, you know, how we stabilise um, uh, the role of the, of the civil servant to stay, say no to the minister, um, certainly uh, I mean, when I remember when my father took over as Secretary of State in 1979, and the relationship, I, I, I sat in a supper meeting that he had with his permanent secretary, who was Patrick Nan, um, and listened to them uh, talking about how they were going to run the, de uh, the old Department of Health and Social Security. And I think that kind of um, um, formal and rather deferential, respectful relationship is, is from a bygone era, and we're in a different world, and that's changed the nature of what happens in private offices. And I think it's much harder in the kind of informality uh, of, you know, where people are on first name terms, it's actually harder for people to say no. Um, uh, I, I don't know what the answer to this is, but there's another problem, which is we've now partly codified that relationship, you know, the ministerial code, the civil service code, um, and what is not codified, you know, is that important? Or actually, do we need to still talk about um, that the code, or do, you, do you carry on making the code more and more comprehensive to cover every eventuality? Or do you keep the code very simple so that people are still required to exercise their judgment? And I would say the latter. Um, um, and to tend to treat codes as a Christmas tree you see adding to them, I think that's a mistake. Um, but again, it's something that needs to be talked about. Um, one of the things that's been recommended by the Better Government Initiative is that the Cabinet Secretary should have been able to issue a kind of letter of, require, require a letter of direction to allow Tony Blair to send this letter to the President saying, um, Whatever happens, I'll all be with you, always be with you, because it hadn't been through any procedure. Maybe, maybe that we we need a kind of procedural letter of direction system, like we have for accounting. I don't know. Uh, it's something we're thinking about. Um, Adam, thank you uh, for that. Um, uh, I can't remember what the question was. The follow-on from the password. Oh, what, how do how do we inform, how do we make our you know how, how do we avoid our um, our report's becoming a... Oh, no, sorry. Say it again? It's, well, just the follow-on about the... Oh, yeah, national. Well, I mean, I think the conversation has been um, happening. Um, I don't think any conclusion has been reached. Um, but some things are happening. There is going to be a leadership academy. Um, I don't know. Watch this space. Um, it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't rejected out of hand, if I remember correctly, in the, um, in the government's response. Um, but I think it's some people who've got to climb off some high horses in order to get to the destination that we want. And Dave, um, I'm afraid um, select committees don't have the kind of powers that congressional committees have. We can't, we can't direct budgets, we can't order the executive. Um, we can only persuade, and I suppose that's something I've learnt just because you make a recommendation. Um, uh, you've still got to get behind the scenes and talk to people about it and persuade them. So it's, a, it's an ongoing conversation. It is a conversation piece in that respect. And with, uh, with regard to Brexit, if I can put my, my Brexit hat on, 
I think the key to Brexit is to make things really simple. Um, uh, we should avoid trying to negotiate a whole multitude of things in the withdrawal agreement, because otherwise we won't get an agreement. Uh, and we should keep as much as possible the same when we leave. I mean, I'm afraid Gus O'Donnell was 100% wrong when he said we'd have to sift through everything, every single legal EU legal instrument, uh, and it would take years and years before we could leave. Um, uh, we're just going to reclaim our independence like any other country, just translate all the superior law into our own law and, and leave. We can do that very simply. I don't think that, I think there is a, the, 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 the big tasks are what the trade department's going to be doing um, and what the various departments are going to be doing, taking back responsibility for policies for which they have not had responsibility in the past. Those are going to be the big tasks. Um, uh, but those policies, I mean, for example, agriculture, the sensible thing to do is use quite a lot of sellotape in the withdrawal agreement and just sellotape in place the common agricultural policy as a national policy um, and carry on doing more or less the same thing as we were when we were in the EU and then evolving <coughs> from that situation. I don't see a big bang type challenge in leaving the EU. It's a far less complicated thing to do to leave the EU than to join the EU because when you join the EU, you've got to align all your laws and your policies with the EU policies. Well, we're already aligned, and we can keep them aligned even if we leave. So it's a far simpler task to leave than to join. Excellent. Teetering into another debate, a yes. bigger debate there, but... Well, I'm defending the government. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, question here. Um, David Hammond. Um, Bernard, I just wanted to emphasize a point you made about looking ahead at the, what is going on through the digital transformation of the private sector and as well apply in future to the public sector. Twenty years ago, I was the permanent secretary at GCHQ and we launched into the digital world. My successors have, I think probably alone in government, succeeded in riding that technology. And it's interesting to speculate why. Indeed, they've done it so successfully that uh, the exposure of their success has set off a moral panic about privacy across Europe. But why? Is it because they did it themselves and they didn't hand their requirements over to consultants to define for them? Is it because they're a long way away from ministers and they had no ministerial interference with their uh, management? You can speculate on a number of possible reasons. Is it because their mission remained under, unchanged and very clear through government, so they did not have the ups and downs of the political cycle? I think it would be worth your investigating that. Am I allowed to visit GCHQ? Um, <laughs> yes, I'm I, sure they would be delighted I, to I, see I, you. I would, but I mean, it is so, so obviously it's about the people. Um, and, and it's about all those things, about the, the mission and the, the capability. Thank you very much for coming. And, um, uh, and it's about the leadership. Um, but um, I, I, I would submit that there's been a very great deal of experimentation um, and reflective learning and learning from success and failure. Um, I think software people do that a lot. Um, mm. But yes, I think it's a very good idea. And particularly, and maybe the rest of the digital capability of government could learn from GCHQ. Incidentally, digital was one of the um, core capabilities that came up as one that the government must retain for itself. And it was interesting, at one stage we were sub, you know, everything was being subcontracted to Fujitsu and Microsoft and, um, uh, and I think Francis, very, very wisely said we need a digital fast stream and brought in people. Um, when I visited Ruby McGregor, who's now stepped down from, uh, from Mighty, uh, and incidentally, I think she is entitled to feel some chagrin that her successor is paid a great deal more than she was. Um, um, the, the, um, I asked her, well, who does your systems? Who, do, you know, who does your, your software development? Oh, she said, we always do it in-house. <laughs> so there was a great contracting business 
that, um, realised that that was a core, core competence they needed in-house. Um, I think we need to think much more about how we maintain our own agility. And indeed, the whole, the whole defence acquisition piece, and I've written a paper with, about this <coughs> with, with um, uh, uh, Chris Donnelly, um, about if we want agile acquisition, defence acquisition, we're going to need to keep far more capabilities in the Ministry of Defence and indeed onshore, otherwise we're simply going to be finished up in the hands of contract contractors and contracts which uh, aren't necessarily going to provide us with the agile capability that we need. Thank you, Bert. Um, thank you for that. Um, a wonderful tour of so many sort of sets of issues um, and uh, you know, it's the landscape of government. I, I sit there both thinking this is an excellent inquiry and uh, really important for the UK. I also sit there thinking, I hope you'll be able to make it tractable and focus it in uh, on a few things. But I hope today has helped and I hope it kicks off various uh, conversations between yourself, uh, the committee and the people assembled here. Uh, and we will certainly be looking forward to welcoming you back after the committee publishes the report. Because uh, I think we'd love to have you uh, explain the reasoning and the thinking and how you hope that will uh, push forward into the future once you get to the end of this work. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Julie.